So we understand that our bodies need oxygenated blood all the time. It's not something we can wait on. And the more we wait, we go from ischemia to infarction and we're unable to regain that tissue. And so we need to act quickly. And in order to do that, we need to notice what signs and symptoms we would see with someone with a compromised perfusion issue. So in infants, we're gonna see things like poor feeding, poor weight gain, failure to thrive or a dusky color. And that's often related to some kind of congenital issue, some kind of problem with their heart that wasn't I'd noticed um, you know, before they were born and now needs to be corrected, often surgically. But you'll be talking about that more in your pediatrics course. Now with toddlers and children, you could see developmental delays or squatting and fatigue. Um, again, for some congenital things that were not noticed earlier. Um, and then really it's gonna be problem-based. So you're gonna look for things, ask about things like pain, syncope, syncope means passing out, dizziness. Dizziness happens when the brain's not getting enough oxygen and you can feel really lightheaded. Dyspnea, being short of breath, edema, swelling, uh, bleeding and bruising or fatigue are all things you can see with different types of perfusion issues. On exam, you would notice their blood pressure and their heart rate specifically are good indications of uh, perfusion. Um, and when you're inspecting, you're gonna look for skin tone or discoloration. Um, you could also palpate, uh, you notice things like swelling or redness. You'd wanna palpate their pulses, distal pulses, like the radius and the pedal pulses, give us an indication of if we're perfusing down to the tips of our toes and down to the tips of our fingers. And we're gonna look at the upper and lower extrem extremities for things like skin turgor, temperature, cap refill, and those again, peripheral pulses. And finally, we would auscultate for heart sounds. So these are the types of exam findings that you would want to look for in the vital signs and then with looking, listening and feeling to really get a good sense of a patient's perfusion status. Now there are a number of common diagnostic tests involved. Uh, there are cardiac enzymes or markers um, such as troponin and those can give us a really quick snapshot if the heart is having right now having ischemia or infarct. So if there's cell death in the heart right now, we're gonna see a bump in cardiac enzymes. Those are very sensitive tests that um, you know, those cardiac enzymes don't bump for like three days. They bump right when it's happening. So if you have a, a elevated troponin level, an elevated cardiac marker, you know that, that there's a perfusion problem to the heart right now. Serum, serum lipids, those fatty um, substances that cholesterol that float through the bloodstream and can cause problems with perfusion. We can get complete blood cell count. It's going to give us things like a red blood cell level and a hemoglobin level and a platelet count. Things that tell us about clotting and tell us about the ability of our blood to be able to transport oxygen. Um, blood coagul coagulopathy studies. So things like PT, PTT, INR that talk about the ability for our blood to clot either too fast or too slow or hopefully just right, right Goldilocks? Um, and finally, bone marrow biopsy is where um, immature blood cells are born, and so we can biopsy there as well. An electrocardiogram, an ECG, or some people say an EKG, it's when you put leads on a patient's chest, stickers with um, attached electrodes, you hook it up to a monitor, and it'll give an actual readout of what you see um, in the electrical system of the heart. Now, keep in mind, it's not talking about the pumping of the heart. The EKG just tells us what the electricity system is doing. We can also do cardiac stress tests. Put the heart under a little bit of stress and see how it does. Um, it can be either an exercise test, which is preferred, or they can give the heart some medicine to stress it out a little bit to see if it can compensate and, and handle a little bit of, of physiologic stress to know if it's working well. And then of course, there's some radiographic studies we can do. Most commonly, we're gonna do things like ultrasounds, um, x-rays, or even uh, um, echocardiograms, where it's kind of like an EKG with an ultrasound combined, looking at the real pump function of the mechanical part of the heart. Now for this 
purpose of this class, we're not really getting into reading cardiac monitors. But like I was talking about with the EKG, there's different um, points in an EKG reading, like you see down here, um, that tell us about what's going on with the heart. So the P wave is first, and that talks about the atria contracting. And then you get this big QRS, which is the womp of the ventricles pushing blood out to the body. And then you have this T wave that kind of is the um, repolarizing uh, kind of the recovery of the ventricles as part of that. So we see the atria contracting with the P wave. We see the big womp of the ventricles with the QRS and then the recovery of the ventricles with the T wave. And sometimes we can see U waves if there's problems with our fluids and electrolytes, but we're not gonna go there yet. But that's the information that the cardiac monitor gives us. Remember, cardiac monitoring talks to us about the electrical system above the heart, not the pump of the heart. Hopefully the pump and the electric system are, are doing the same thing, but not always. Okay, so we have patients with problems with perfusion and we need to know how to manage them both as nursing and through collaborative interventions. So let's talk about what those interventions are. Now, as always, we talk about prevention as the primary way that we're going to treat this. And so we want to encourage smoking cessation, cessation um, diet. We want to encourage a healthy uh, heart, healthy diet, encourage regular exercise and also weight control because we know that those are modifiable risk, risk factors related with the concept of perfusion. And if we're talking about secondary prevention, remember secondary prevention means screening. The most common one, it's cheap, it's easy, it's accessible, is blood pressure screenings. You can go to the Walgreens and just do your own blood pressure screening. You know, your doctor checks this at your, at your clinic every time you go in for an exam. A blood pressure can give us a good idea of just the perfusion um, in the body. If it's too, if there's too much, if it's there's, if the body's under stress from that um, and how adequately it's being perfused. And if we're talking about collaborative interventions, really the treatment is going to depend on the underlying condition. I think if I had a dollar for every time I said that, uh, we'd be rich, wouldn't we? Cause that's the, that's the kind of the name of the game here. Every treatment's a little bit different depending on the condition itself. But the most common strategies are going to be things like diet modification, smoking cessation, increasing activity, which is conditioning, making sure that heart, the heart's a muscle, right? So we go to the gym and we work out and we get our muscles bigger and stronger and able to handle more. If you think about someone who's, if you've ever trained for a marathon, I have never trained for a marathon and I never will, but I have a good friend who did and she started out not as a runner at all, you know, couldn't run a mile. And over the year, she raised money for, um, a, a, a charity and ran the Chicago Marathon. And over that year, she conditioned her heart to be able to be more efficient and handle more work. And so that's what activity does is it makes our heart more efficient at handling more work. And of course there's pharmacotherapy. You're gonna see this all the time on our, our hospitalized patients because so many of them have perfusion issues and patients are gonna be on blood pressure medications and anti-lipid cholesterol medications. These are very common things we're going to see in the patients that we serve. Now there's a number of different pharmacotherapies that are mentioned in your Giddens text as well in Davis. Uh, the ones highlighted here are the ones we want to focus on for this class. We'll be going through some of these in class, but I want you to focus on the ones that are highlighted. So vasodilators, so it's going to help dilate or open up those blood vessels. Diuretics are going to help reduce the amount of fluid. So someone who has fluid overload, too much fluid in their vascular system, we need to help get some of that off. So they're going to pee that off. Anticoagulants preventing um, blood clots from forming, antiplatelets. Antiplatelets are gonna prevent platelets from sticking together and causing thrombus. Thrombolytics are, are uh, agents that literally break up clots. They're clot busters for things like strokes, clots in the brain, it literally goes and breaks those clots up. In antilipidemics, um, antilipids, lipid meaning fat, so these cholesterol reducing agents. These are the main ones we're gonna focus on for the purpose of fundamentals, but you really need to have a good understanding of these meds because uh, no matter what our patients are in the hospital for, 
oftentimes you're going to find patients on these types of medications and it's good to have a good sense on how those work. Now there are a number of procedures and surgical interventions that are indicated and it really depends on the type of underlying cause. So if the heart's electrical system isn't telling the heart to beat as often as it should, you can have a pacemaker put in as a backup electrical system. You can have an electrical cardioversion where we literally shock the heart back into a normal rhythm if it's going crazy and the electrical system is spasming. Uh, ablation ther therapies are areas where you can literally cauterize or kind of burn um, and kill ar areas that are hyperactive in their electrical pulses. They've got too much going on and you can just dull those areas out so that they stop overreacting electrically. There's balloon pumps that are gonna help with perfusion on patients who are having heart attacks, um, valve surgeries, cardiac transplants, um, so many different things, bypasses that are gonna help reperfuse when certain areas are just all clogged up. It's like a, like a bad clog in your, in your sink. Um, we just make a, new, make a new pipe, just go somewhere else. Let's just make a new pipe and that'll get perfusion to that area. We can do stents that help open up clogged arteries and then endardectomies are when they actually open up the um, carotid arteries, the ones that perfuse and bring blood flow to the brain when those get full of plaque and are narrowing so there's not enough blood flow to the brain. It's all about blood flow. Remember, perfusion is just a fancy word for blood flow. And so there are, what you need to know from this slide is that there are a number of surgical interventions that can help with blood flow to the body. Now, basically every concept we could possibly think of is going to interrelate to this idea of perfusion because it is so central and vital to human life. We can't go two minutes without perfusion, right? So we need good perfusion, oxygenation down to the tissue level from good, strong central perfusion that can be able to get those, um, get the oxygenated blood to the tips of our toes. And all of these interrelated concepts play into the idea of perfusion. Your Giddens text lists a number of featured exemplars. And for the course, the sake of this week's course, we're gonna be focusing on two very common exemplars you'll see in the clinical setting. And those are hypertension and stroke. So we know that um, issues with perfusion are very common in the patients that we serve. And there's something that we need to know how to address, recognize the problems with, and know how to intervene. I hope you found this interesting and useful. Thank you so much for studying along with me as we discuss the concept of perfusion.